thanks Alina for the introduction and also thanks to Ray for uh, facilitating. And of course, thanks to you, Daniel, for being with us today. Um, today we have about uh, 30 to 45 minutes to hear much more from you, to hear about Copa Cojeca, your role, and of course, especially about the Code of Conduct, a contractual agreement for data sharing in agriculture. And I will have a lot of questions for you, how that all happened, what was difficult, what are the next steps? But uh, maybe first of all, would you like to introduce you and also briefly Copa Cojeca? Hello, uh, good afternoon. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, to be here with you. I'm coming from a, a farming background uh, from the north of Portugal. My family um, uh, is in the business of olive oil and, and wine. Um, even though uh, when, when I was born, I would say 99% of my family would work on agriculture. Now, less than 50% in particular new generations have not been uh, so active on agriculture. I think this is also an evolution of the times, but it's also very much related with the topic we are going to talk today. So having this background, it is a privilege for me to be here representing the voices of uh, 22 million farmers and their families and 22,000 cooperatives across Europe. Uh, we are um, uh, two organizations, in fact. Uh, Coop uh, represents the interests of European farmers and Kojeka, the interests of uh, agri-cooperatives across Europe. We are members in 26 member states, and we have also other partner organizations, including now, uh, of course, uh, UK, but also Switzerland, Turkey, um, Norway, and, and other countries. So we are very much representative. And uh, having uh, Kojeka um, representing agri-cooperatives, they actually uh, they play a quite a very important role on the questions of data sharing. Cooperatives are a democratic run uh, body uh, where the decision making uh, is made by their associates, so farmers, and, and they create these structures and infrastructure that will enable uh, very much also to engage in the, in the digital and the data sharing. So this, this is a particular interest for both organizations. Uh, but I, I feel that in this discussion, very often the cooperatives are not taken on board as much as, as, as they should. We all talk about data sharing for farmers. And so uh, we, are, we are working in seven different languages uh, to enable that farmers actually exchange data between themselves um, and they are able to agree on, on the positions and it's very important to reach also our, our members in the different member states and, it's, it's, and to tell them that Europe is not only about Brussels, it's also to reach out to everyone outside. Um, and so for Copa Cojeca, we are very supportive of the EU common policies. Uh, common agriculture policy has been obviously uh, very important with these years. It has delivered on affordable and nutritious food for consumers in Europe. It has delivered on a, on a very good single market, perhaps the most developed single market inside the EU. Um, and has, of course, very much delivered um, during this food, uh, the, the COVID-19, where food never stopped coming to our plate high quality with the highest standards uh, in terms of food safety, environment, animal welfare, and animal welfare in the world. Um, and uh, we are still committed to during the second wave to continue delivering on the food security for all Europeans. Thank you, David. It sound, sounds really good. And I love the fact uh, that you're coming from an from a olive oil uh, background. That's also, I didn't know that. That's a, that's a really nice uh, aspect of the story. And um, you mentioned the cooperatives that um, you're working with, that you're representing. Were they the starting point to talk about data sharing and its governance? Or how did it happen? Um, both, actually. Both farmers and cooperatives. Um, a good thing that we are all together in the same uh, uh, body of discussion, even though there are two different organizations. Um, we do have a presidium where all the presidents of the organizations for farmers are there and all a presidium for Cojeca, so for the cooperatives and all the presidents of the cooperative associations are there. So, but in the end, they, they, they tend to agree between themselves because it is important that we are speaking at one voice. And um, this discussion was very important because farmers are using data, are collecting data, are already processing data and they are interacting with other partners in the food chain. It's not only about farming or the cooperatives, it's also about the input industries, seeds, breeding. Uh, it's about 
uh, our our uh, customers, uh, for example, processing um, or uh, um, uh, products uh, that are sold to the consumer, or cooperatives that then are selling uh, fruits and vegetables. So the the data is actually flowing already uh, through the value chain. It's reaching the consumer, and there was a lot of discussion about, so who owns the data, right? So if you will talk to my uh, members three or four years ago, and they will say, everyone was saying, farmers need to share the data, data is the next oil, it's, it, the value of data is billions. And the first thing my member said is, Daniel, go there and get my million because we also want to have a part of that data. We also want to have a part of that value. And the second question is, so who, who has the rights on the data and how can farmers also use data? And it was important because everyone was, I think, talking about a different type of data. Everyone in the food chain was talking about the data they were interested in and not talking about a, a, a common framework where data could circulate and everyone could have benefits. And so that was the beginning. So no one in my organization would agree on sharing data but everyone wanted to benefit from the data. So it was important to have this conversation about what kind of principles we need to have in place to make sure that farmers are able to give data to cooperatives and cooperatives give data to someone else and share data with someone else. But then data from the consumer, for example, would come back to the farmer and the farmer will be able actually to change the way he does things and adapt to the market needs, for example. Um, and Today, farmers want to share their data with the consumer. They want to provide further information, but they have very little tools in order to do that. You know, some of the, the, the little tools we have is sometimes a small label on, on, on a product saying maybe where it was made, etc. But farmer is willing to do more. And that was part of the motivation. And the second motivation was also today, farmers are expected uh, to get more return from the market and get less public money support. At the same time, we're already talking today that we need to uh, get stringent requirements, more ambitious uh, targets for farmers, and we are very much supportive of it. But on the other hand, we need to have the enablers. So if we are to get more money from the market, return for the market, and we have more stringent requirements on less use of pesticides, less use of antimicrobials, we are willing to do that. But then how can we enable this? And data actually, and the use of new technologies is actually one of the enablers that will allow us to deliver on the EU framework, what is required, and also to keep us competitive with the rest of the world. We can't forget that in order to get return from the market, we need to sell our product. And if the world is also interested to buy in, in our sustainable products, high quality products, they are recognized internationally, we are selling, um, and, but we are also buying from other partners. So we are very much integrated in this and we need to keep this in order to enable farmers to invest and uh, deliver on the EU framework. So the data is very much part of this discussion. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about the farmers and the cooperatives as, as main stakeholders um, in, in the agriculture data sharing ecosystem, and you brought also in the consumers. Uh, thank you very much for that. feels like that's the, the beginning and, well, the other side of the value chain. Um, what are the stakeholders? Well, very much from, let's start from the beginning. We farmers, mm -hmm. we produce, but we also get some inputs. We have seeds, we have fertilizer, we have genetic material, um, and they also need data from the farmer and we need data from them. So if we want to have better uh, genetic material in order to have, you know, um, deal with climate change if we need varieties that deal better with water stress, uh, we want to reduce the use of um, some of the substances, then we need to provide them with data that they will allow to do the research and come out with the genetic material that will ref provide us what we, what we need to grow. So it is very important. So this is already creating value for everyone. And then also we need, after us, we have also contractuals that are doing business in, in a you know, providing some uh, machinery or some specialized uh, equipment or services that the farmer pr prefers to get it from outside that comes to the farm, does that specific business, but also collects data. 
Uh, we have also machinery uh, that uh, that we buy or we rent. So the machinery group was also very much interested. Um, and then we have food processors. We have um, antibiotics, animal health, um, all of these um, until the consumer, including also administration, public administration, that is also collecting and providing data and also making some controls um, to, to ensure that the public money is well uh, spent. So there mm -hmm. is a variety of actors that have an interest on collecting data, that the farmer has access to the data, and that value is generated, that everyone will be able to, um, uh, to benefit. And one clear example is, you know, with Galileo and Copernicus initiatives from the European Commission, they are being used for environmental monitoring. They're also now being able to, uh, you know, uh, ensure that farmers are compliant with the requirements of the public administration on controls, but they're also interested in enable farmers to have more tools to improve compliance because climate uh, situations change uh, and it is good to have constant influx of data and say, attention, this is going this direction. If you take this action right now, you can actually um, uh, make an improvement for yourself, for us. And, and so this is, this is very important. It's very complex, but I think we are all in the same, in the same uh, direction and in the same, uh, uh, let's say, um, dialogue. Um, and, and that's the most exciting. Thank you. Um, thanks for making the, this complex ecosystem a little bit more clear for us. Um, and I understand that um, that data sharing in agriculture is um, to be competitive for the agriculture um, business to be more self-sustaining, for innovation to realize uh, ecological goals, to be compliant. And yeah, you made it really clear that, the, that this um, ecosystem is really large. And um, this makes it also very clear why data sharing governance is needed. So can you explain us a little bit more um, what is the um, code of conduct by, by contractual agreement? How will it help? So it was actually the discussion we were having uh, that I was explaining between our farmers, our cooperatives. Um, they realized that uh, we are not alone and we need to have our partners that are sharing data. Uh, together. So we, we reach out to all these organizations, we reach out for all the chain, and most of the chain actually came out to us and said, mm, we actually have exactly the same challenges, and we are actually probably in the same page. So we got together to see, so how can we have kind of a governance rules around? We cannot, we, we are European organizations, so we could not do, um, uh, how to say, we cannot do a full governance um, uh, package, but we came out with a code of conduct on data sharing, uh, mainly through uh, contractual arrangement that try to address some of these uh, common uh, principles on sharing data that we could agree. So of course, this is still has to be developed, it still has to be completed. And some of the things can only be done by regulators, cannot be done by private actors. But um, we came out in after two years of conversations and we actually reached an agreement on a few principles. Uh, one of them being that those who collected the data, uh, so the, the, where if the data is generated on the farm or during farm operations, then the, the farmer should have the leading role on controlling and reusing that data. So if you, for example, share the data with a third party, so you have a contractual coming to the farm, collecting the data, sharing with the farmer, but then if he would like to share the data with third parties, then the farmer should be also um, provide consent to for use of this data. Uh, we also reach uh, a consensus on sensitive data that should not be shared with third parties, or if it's IP data or uh, related to, for example, the functioning of a machine, the farmer is not interested to get the understanding of the function of the machine, but he's interested to do what the machine does in the farm. So it is, so this kind of sensitive data was an agreement that we will not be able to share. So this this is um, uh, a voluntary approach to begin with. Um, why voluntary? Because um, first of all, we are not regulators. It is a political um, endorsement to our organizations and therefore trying that our members uh, from all the organizations that they implement. But also because the technology is still maturing. And at this stage, we also want to see the potential of the technology to um, um, to come out 
And we know that sometimes early uh, AV regulation can actually um, undermine the development of certain technologies. And we in the agriculture world, we, we know very much how can regulation can actually be um, a red tape on top of what we're doing and, and uh, disabling us of using certain safe, safe technologies that other people in the world can use. And so it was important for us to create a dialogue, a common framework, and because we were also very much in, in coordination with the uh, European Commission, we consult them, we very much contributed to their work. We feel that this was also a stepping stone that provides some, um, uh, I want to say, a vision for what the Commission is now coming forward with proposals uh, that are not very far from what we, we, we discuss. Of course, they go a little bit further. They have all the tools that we don't have. But um, I, I want to believe that we contributed to the work of the Commission, that we enable them to understand what they are, the specificities of the agri-food world and the needs of the agri-food world that would allow them to create a framework that will enable us to continue investing um, on the EU framework, to remain as competitive and to um, create one of the biggest markets in the world of data and agriculture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm, and um, you said, um, well, there, there's a role for the regulators and for the private actors. Um, too much regulation can, can hinder technological innovation, but a governance framework would be needed. Um, and as I know you have, you have been with the Commission yourself, what would you expect from the Commission next to create this framework? innovation and competitiveness well in, in general um not talking only about data uh, we we have to ensure that we bring young people into farming uh, with uh, new ideas we need to ensure that farmers will be able to invest because if we want to do something about climate change we need people to invest in order to get there and so from, from regulators, we expect that we'll, they will put in place a, a regulatory framework that follows science decision making, the science data, that to ensure that every regulation that we do, it's science-based, um, and therefore will enable us to invest. On data governance, we need to create structures, uh, support, for example, uh, today we already have a lot of data that is collected by uh, the Commission, collected by Copernicus, collected by Galileo, by meteorological uh, stations, by national administrations. We need to enable them to be available for farmers, for example, could be available for other, oh, I'm sure other operators are interested. Now I'm talking just about farmers that are um, available in a readable form, uh, easy, uh, free of access. And that, you know, and these will allow them to use the data in a way to create generate value. Mm -hmm. This is one of the roles, for example, of, of, of um, our, our um, European uh, or uh, from the Commission and other European institutions. So that would be quite interesting. Also, to have kind, you know, uh, GDPR was very important to have a framework for that uh, privacy. It creates a level playing field uh, to create an European, like the European Commission is proposing, to go in the European data spaces to have a, a general framework. This is very welcome. We are welcome this very much. Um, and so to build up on top of the code of conduct and to enable that these principles that are agreed across the chain could be universal among uh, the, the digital single market, that would be a step forward. You mean universal also for other sectors? Uh, no, for the agri-food sector, we, uh, agri sector, we understand different mm -hmm. sectors have different needs. Mm -hmm. We don't expect all the sectors to follow our, our needs or our specificities. We also expect them not, we don't, need to also follow other sectors um, mm -hmm. to be imposed on us. So we, we understand that every sector has a specificity and, and there is room for the agri-food sector. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with you about the sectors. However, probably there's something that other sectors can learn from your approach. Would you agree? Yeah, I think we are the only sectors who got together on one code of conduct setting some transparent and unanimous uh, principles along the food chain. Um, and this was very much appreciated by, by the European Commission and also by our members. Because now they are replicating. So asking about what are the next steps. And the next steps are how to make sure 
that these principles then they go get into contracts, they get into data collection, and that can only happen if your members buy in and they are translating the codes in their languages, they are bring, you know, bringing in together their national coalitions together with machinery inputs and bringing this into uh, the contracts, bringing into the, the operations they have with other partners. And, and, and I think we are very proud of this because uh, if this is, if we are not together, if the sector is not together, um, we will not be able to deliver. It's simple as that. If we don't get in a common, it's like one of the key issues for data sharing is to have common standards. So if we don't have a common standard in terms of governance, working uh, politically, that is um, uh, common for all the, the all the partners in the chain, is very difficult to build up trust. And trust is the biggest value that is generated in every activity. And for data sharing, it will be crucial. You um, you mentioned translation of contracts. Mm -hmm. so Sorry, it, you were breaking up a little bit. Can you still hear me? Yes. Great. The um, translation of contracts um, you mentioned. I know that you also um, have some expertise um, towards international trade. Mm -hmm. um, if if I got that right, so how which roles are the countries playing in the sector when it comes to data sharing? So and how it, difficult maybe was that to combine them? So in the European Union, the code of conduct has been already translated into um, um, English, so English, French, Italian, and Spanish. And if we will be launching by the end of the year, most likely German, um, Polish, and Finnish. Um, so this within the European Union. Then uh, with third countries, we cooperate uh, of course, they were not involved on our code, or we were not involved in the other codes. And I know at least United States have something similar. New Zealand had something similar. Canada, no, uh, Australia has just launched also a, um, a similar initiative. Um, and I'm probably missing a couple of others. Uh, but we all drink from each other's experience. Um, when we were doing the code of conduct uh, for data sharing, I was in New Zealand and they were having exactly the same conversation. They had already launched uh, or were about to launch a similar initiative. And I had the pleasure to exchange with them on, on this. It was very interesting to see their approach. We also, of course, we have uh, every two years, we have a, a big conference with North America, Canada, United States and Mexico uh, for farmers. And we exchange about it and data sharing was obviously a very important um, area where we, we, we had a very good collaboration. And of course, you will see that, you know, we are farmers around the world. We are facing the same challenges and all of the codes have the more very similar principles. Farmers should have the leading role on, on, uh, on uh, using the data. Farmer needs to have access to the data. Um, and, and I think it's a little bit universal. Even though there are specificities, mm -hmm. we could say in the United States, maybe there are, the, the thing was done a little bit different, uh, but um, I think the principle to enable data sharing, create value that is universal among the, among the different codes. So um, when on this international level, do you also then talk about standards and interoperability? Uh, we is talk very goal? much about interoperability. Uh, the standards, um, it is very much industry leading. Uh, so you will have uh, standards for in, uh, machines to work to talk on this we want to see standards to be agreed we encourage but we don't are we are not that involved in terms of setting these standards in terms of um i cannot hear you anymore elena could you acknowledge if that's just me or everyone i cannot hear daniel right now. either all right let me give him some time maybe to reconnect well, and let uh, the information sink in about this super complex sec sector, the agriculture sector and the uh, the value chain. And, and at the same time, yes, Adina? Oh. I think Daniel, that... Are you back? I lost you for 30 seconds. Yes, uh, and... Uh, and I lost you exactly when you said, Adina, uh, Adina can you <laughs> see if we're talking about it or not? All right. Well, I I got you again. I just uh, said that uh, having a moment to let this sink in that how the agriculture sector, although being so complex, um, is uh, so having such a leading role 
um, in, in Europe, but apparently also internationally uh, towards data sharing and the code of conduct. Mm -hmm. And it's very impressive. Yeah, and, I, th um, I think everyone is impressed when I, they realize that the food we have in our plates is so high tech at this stage. I don't think, mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the things we're trying to change is the perception of people that uh, believe that we should go back to the 19th century agriculture that was so inefficient. Um, and today, when we're talking about collecting data to create value, it's basically to understand better what we do and to do in a better way, more efficient way. And if we do it in a more efficient way, it'll be beneficial for our environment. And, and so the agri-food sector is using iTech as any other sector in order to do things better. Um, I imagine if we was telling our people now that our vaccine, creating these vaccines against COVID-19 and say, you cannot use the newest technologies <laughs> in order to create a vaccine that will um, um, be beneficial for the whole world. Mm -hmm. And what we want to now is to have access to safe, safe technology like uh, digital um, in order to enable us to do things better and actually to deliver on the environment, to deliver on climate change, to deliver on food safety, to deliver on our competitiveness, make sure that we can also uh, have an opportunity within the EU economy. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the pressure is also rising, what, what I can see from here um, the, with the Green Deal, so the pressure on agriculture to do its part is that a is that a pressure is that um, a challenge or more an opportunity to uh, also for data sharing in agriculture right now it's an opportunity when we try to have a common vision around the world to deliver on climate change and farmers you know you will not find a climate denier in agriculture we see it every day in our fields we have all interest in order to tackle climate change and also to be able to navigate about the impact of climate change in our farms. So what will make it a bigger opportunity or a challenge is whether we are enable or not to invest. If we can't invest on new technologies like collecting data, uh, taking advantage of Copernicus or Galileo, uh, not, or using the, the newest technology, a better machine to make it more efficient, uh, to invest in drones so that uh, you know we can um, Bring, instead of using machines on, on slopes and avoid leakage, we can use actually come with drones and spray on exactly with loud uh, risk substances. So mm -hmm. if we are unable to do this, we can actually turn this into bigger opportunity because mm -hmm. we have nothing against on delivering on a um, higher standards in terms of sustainability. We are in a transition and we are very much interested to come in. We need to be able to use safe technologies and we need to be able to invest. Uh, because if we want uh, to make changes, we need a younger generation come in, take the farms, invest in the farms, invest in technology and do something about it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, keeping the, the rural areas um, living, uh, dynamic and having exactly the access to the same services than urban areas. Because there are no secondhand uh, citizens in Europe. So we need to enable them to, to, to have a prosperous life and a happy life with their families as uh, urban areas. And the data sharing will be extremely important for this. Mm -hmm. So you have, the, you have the code of conduct in place. Mm -hmm. um, you say if there's, uh, if there's investment in technology, um, you can go forward. But you also said that there's some technology to share this data that there's a part missing. Mm -hmm. Did I got you right? So that's some kind of technical aspect um, to actually make the data available um, was still about to come. I got so, this right? so there may be two thoughts on that. The first one is very much linked with the code of conduct and um, a farmer will not take a, a fact sheet and say, this data is okay. This data can go to third party. This data can, this will take a lot of time. But, so we need a, a, a technological solution that will actually enable the farm, the data to go uh, to every partner and respect the principles of the code of conduct. And I know that there are several projects that are ongoing and tackle this. This will make it faster. Second is about collecting data. 
Um, every day, a farmer is buying a new piece of technology that will collect even additional data. Uh, the Commission is investing in more and more um, pieces of te uh, technology, more satellites are going up to the sky and will be collecting more data. And everyone is doing this. And it is important that you know, we agree on the standards to make sure that the machines can talk to each other and the data will be circulated. Um, but it's also important that we have processing capabilities. Um, and in this, uh, artificial intelligence may be one of the enablers for two reasons. The first one, to make sense of all this amount of data that is going. I've seen um, uh, Mrs. Mar uh, Markar today, uh, Doris, she's here, and she made a fantastic presentation in the, in the um, uh, last week in, during the German presidency event on data sharing. The amount of data that is being collected in 2025 is tetra, tetra, tetrabytes of data. We need to make sense of all of that data to ensure that the data, the farmer has a data processing capabilities and thus supports decision making. For that, we will need uh, artificial intelligence to make sense of that. But we will also need, for example, for machines or robotics or automation that will go through the farms. Um, and we can't have, a, a, you know, instead of having a driver uh, checking every inch of that farm, we will have artificial intelligence sh uh, allowing the robot to go through every centimeter, a little bit more slope, a little bit less, and take immediate decisions to adapt. And for that, we will need this capability um, that it will be learning automatically to drive um, these robots around around the farms, around the even in the cooperatives, you know, we have already cleaning robots. I mean, in, in the farms, we are milking robots, feeding robots, and more will come and more devices will be connected. Um, and therefore, it is important to, to have this uh, in place to, to make sense of all of this data. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned there are already many initiatives and, uh, and innovations as you just listed. Um, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, where, where I'm situated right now, we, for example, have joined data as an initiative. Um, that you might be aware of. Um, how do you plan to work together with those initiatives? Can you learn from each other? Or is it, mm -hmm. is it very fragmented? You know, at the beginning it was, but we, we, we learned a lot about joint data when we were also doing our, uh, all this dialogue. Um, we, we as Copa Cocheca, you're, uh, as the secretary of Copa Cocheca, we, of course, we have a, a political uh, body that is situated in Brussels, but the biggest asset we have is our membership and having members in all the countries. And we know that our members are in this project. They are part of all of these projects. And therefore, we, we benefit from having all this information coming in and, and, uh, and uh, being able to contribute uh, this way. And I know that our members are involved in thousands of projects. Uh, we will not be able to follow all of them or participate in all of them due to human resources, but uh, with, with the involvement of our members, we are actually very much engaged in this. Great. Um, we have now, uh, we have been talking now for 35 minutes and I learned about a lot about the complexity, um, but also about the potentials, how with innovation and data sharing governance, um, we can together reach many of the goals, um, let it be economic, but also um, the sustainability goals. Uh, so thank you for that. I know that in this call that there are people that know much more about the agriculture sector, uh, sector actually as I do, as from the support center for data sharing and the European data portal, we are, have more general view on data sharing and open data. So I would like to um, also encourage our, uh, our audience to raise uh, your, uh, your questions, their questions to you. Um, so feel free to unmute or put your questions in chat or raise a hand first. I would take the floor as um, I had my hand raised. Um, first of all, Daniel, thank you very much for the interesting talk. I had a question because um, throughout the talk, we have talked as farmers as a very general term, but there are quite a few different types of farmers with different, um, let's say, levels of maturity across Europe, dependent on one, what type of farmer they are, um, the amount of resources they have, and the economic situation of the country. How... Uh, how are you helping, let's say, to have this have mm, support them in a balance for all of them to have a voice in these conversations and to ensure 
the, that the quality of data that they are sharing, that they are processing, and that um, they are utilizing is of a standard that is actually useful for not only themselves, but for the broader community. So in terms of all the farmers, um, we as an organization, we are very proud that all the farmers have a voice and have, everyone is represented. And so we enable this via having multiple uh, farmer organizations uh, in different parts of Europe. In the same country, we have countries where we have four or five farmer organizations and they are all member of us. Um, and these enable us to go even through the political spectrum um, and to be able to be the voice of farmers. And having also the cooperatives within, uh, this really gives us a massive coverage uh, and 26 different member states. Um, and these make us make of us very representative. We have also structures where the farmers they take the lead. So our our decision making body is basically we have our working parties and we have working parties for every commodity from pygmy to flowers to organic. Organic being already in Copacoteca, I think, for more than 20 years. Um, and we have been very, very supportive to develop the organic market. And we are very proud of what has been achieved. And we hope we, we are going to achieve even more ambitious goals. And we also have horizontal working parties. And they are the ones that are in charge of coming out with our policies, to come out with our reports, that then will be agreed by the, the, um, the presidents of each organization. And we uh, tend to have decisions by unanimity or consensus. So that gives us an idea about how we, are, we manage to, to represent uh, the farming world across Europe. Um, and then it's a very important point. It's how then you make, how to make sure that all the farmers will actually be able to benefit from data sharing be able to um, to invest. Um, and one of the models uh, that are cooperatives are actually a very nice enabler. They have been doing this already for many, uh, for decades, where they enable thousands of producers, some of them big, some of them smaller, some of them very small, in order to get size, to have a leverage, um, to find new markets, um, and we see them to provide, we even have cooperatives of machinery in, in uh, for example, in France that allow different farmers to have access to specialized machinery that they will not be able to invest otherwise, or that like this is more efficient. And the cooperative will play a very key role on data sharing because they will be able to, and they are already doing, providing training, be able to create size to ensure, you know, the no one wants to buy a, uh, um, data from one farmer, but if you have 20,000 farmers, you can actually have a size that will enable benchmarking between the different farmers of the same cooperative, if they are producing the same, and, and th these will create additional value. But then also there is a role for the European institutions. One of the, the, the enablers for all the farmers to be able to contribute to sustainability and to be able to invest, to have access to data, is to have the right infrastructure, for example, broadband. Because big farmers, they already have access. They can buy satellite access. They can buy the, the newest technology. But we need to enable every farmer to have access to reliable broadband across Europe so that they are able to connect in the first case, but also to have reliable access, that the quality of access is uniform across the farm. Because if he only has access to a small part of the farm and not to the other one, then I'm, I'm sure there'll be issues with, with quality. There'll be issues with um, um, some of the data might go through the connection, some might, might stay in the, on, the, on the machine. And then, you know, there, there'll be all these issues. We need to make sure that they will have this. And we need to make sure that we have um, vocational training, advisory, extension services that will be able to support all the farmers across. Um, uh, research and innovation, um, that the farmers are involved at the beginning of the research project. You have no idea how many times per week I get at least one project coming to my office and say, Copacoteca must support this project. I have the solution for all the problems of the farmers. And then I ask them, did you have involved a farmer? Did this idea come from a problem of a farmer? And I send them back and say, spend two weeks in a farm. 
I guarantee you, you will find many problems. You will be able to solve them. And the neighbor will be the first customer you will have. And the next neighbor will buy it immediately. Because the farmer, if the farmers are involved since the beginning, I'm sure things will work out better. Uh, and these are just a few of the policies that can help us. Um, having the invest Generation EU enabling investment on uh, um, new technologies, digital drones, etc. Um, it will be crucial as well. Thank you. Um, I have one more follow up and it's all mindful of time. And you already touched upon it in your very, very detailed answer. One, is there an issue that all farmers, irrespective of their size, capacity or their focus, um, need support on? And the second part is how can the EU, other institutions, other citizens support them and the agricultural sector as a whole going forward? given COVID-19 in the world situation as is? Yeah, um, yeah I, I try already to touch some of those those topics. Um, and the first, I think we need to realize that the fact that we have a single market, and if we have a digital single market that is EU level, with a level playing field, with the uh, same rules for everyone, that will be a major enabler. We have the experience on the agri-food sector having a common agriculture market that works. It has the lever, it has the scale, and has the level playing field that delivers uh, on food security, quality of the food that we have, affordable food. Um, even during the COVID-19, we deliver, and we are still committed to deliver. So this is an important, we always forget that common policies, they work, they are efficient, and they have delivered to the citizens. And that's why we are very supportive of the EU common policies. Then, of course, um, infrastructure is crucial. And I, I will never stop talking about access to broadband. Um, we need to ensure interoperability. And this is not only in European institutions agreeing on some standards. There is also a role for civil society and very much. And I know that machinery is working on that. Uh, research agenda is extremely important if we want to enable but also other European policies. The common agriculture policy is extremely important as well. It is not the main role of the common agriculture inv uh, to invest only on technology, but is their role to enable the investment of technology. But we need also other funds to come in, the social funds. We need everything that is related with uh, education. Um, we need to give the chance to rural areas for kids to also learn about digital technology. And then when they grow up, they can take a course that is more specialized. And then when they are working on the, on the farming, they will have access to extensive services, advisory. This is extremely important. Um, and also a very important issue is, is about our, how we take decisions in terms of access to technologies. It needs to be science dry, driven. If uh, we don't, then we are shooting our own food. I'm afraid because other other partners will develop these technologies. Um, artificial intelligence, he, it will be a key enabler for the future. Digital, it is. But we also have new breeding, a new geno genomic uh, uh, technologies. Um, you know, they have been awarded the Nobel Prize, and we are still discussing today whether we can access or not. I mean, the world scientific authorities, they are in uh, in agreement. It is, you know. Let's let's use them if they are safe, if they are proven safe, of course. But we are still, oh no, you know, maybe our regulatory framework is not set up to uh, this. It, this will make it very very hard um, yeah, for for farmers and and for the rest of the population. So these are some of the enablers that we need to to put in place. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, and. Um... Unfortunately, already we came to the end of our time, um, but um, I, I'm sure with the speed of the of the developments lately and probably in the next months, um, we, we will talk again soon. Um, we have been at the Support Center for Data Sharing. We have been studying um, the Code of Conduct for Data Sharing in Agriculture and um, are currently working on a, um, on a report about model contract terms for data sharing in different sectors, where one of them is agriculture. Uh, this report will come out in early January, so uh, I hope we can continue our conversation um, based on this and, and see what the next year will bring. Is there any... Happy. 
anything else you would want to make us aware of maybe um, what to uh, to stay tuned something that you're working on or next event we should miss um, we will I think that the, the work that you are doing it, it's very important I've been very supportive of, of this work and we were very much interested to be engaged to bring our, our farmers and I think the next big work that we have to do is uh, an analysis of the governance data that a uh, governance framework that has been put forward, uh, how to enable the digital uh, strategy to move forward and to engage. And this is where we are going to be working. Um, and for the events, uh, we had a lot of things planned and uh, we are waiting a little bit to clear the sky in the next um, uh, weeks and we'll be able, uh, most likely we'll have uh, uh, um, our Congress uh, next uh, in 2022, where we'll also be able to to put forward uh, more policy uh, areas that we are working on. Great, we'll be looking uh, forward to that. And uh, again, thanks for coming. Very really impressive uh, to see your work and to uh, hear you presenting and tell us more about it. Thank you very much. And thanks Thank also you. to the audience, of course, and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thanks. All.